So, um, yeah, some of the stark reality that we've got to grapple with. Professor Okeke Chugu joins us here. He is Executive Director of Development Specs Academy. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Thank you. Well, uh, much as it's supposed to be celebratory mood, the holiday season, but <laughs> clearly that's a current challenge that people have to uh, deal with, as it were. But then today we also do hear mm. the president being quoted to say, we need sacrificing citizens to ensure citizens' progress. It's also an advising them, look, you need to do a lot more. Double your efforts to get the impact. So do you get a sense that, it, because it comes across to several people, the leaders are saying one thing, the economic reality, on the other hand, seems to be at variance with whatever they're saying. Are they really in touch, do you think? It's open to argument whether they are. You're calling for sacrifice from a people who actually has nothing more to sacrifice. Let us suppose I'm working in a government establishment. No, let me even take it beyond that. Because whenever we speak of workers, we think of only government workers. That population, is it up to 2 million or 3 million? No. The real work that keeps you and I going in real terms is that of farmers, organizers, shoemakers, etc. They consider the bulk of the population. Now, let us suppose I'm a security man, whether in a government establishment or in a private house, and I earn 50,000 naira a month. Now, what I spend on, I used to spend on transport before fuel increase, or maybe 9,000. Now I spend more than half of that. Mm -hmm. And so you see that, whereas I'm not a troublemaker, I don't want to create problems for myself, for the government, or for anybody, I can no longer sacrifice because I have no other means of income. That's a challenge. But challenges are not new. It doesn't mean everybody should go bonkers because things are hard. But as you're trying to make sacrifices, as you're enduring, you look around you also to draw inspiration. If your father is telling you, my son, my daughter, please, I want all of you to make sacrifices. Things are difficult. He has a right to do that. But if you don't find that daddy eats chicken in the night, right? After that, he washes it down with a glass of red wine. And he's telling you, don't be difficult, you know, manage that roasted plantain. No matter how much you love your father, you can't cope. And you see him not eating the plantain, which creates for that problem. So two things. The president's advice is correct. Nigerians should make sacrifice. But more importantly, the elite who are in charge of public affairs should be seen to be part of the Nigerians who are being asked to make sacrifice. I drive in fancy cars. I talk about the kind of figures that will make some people look dizzy. I spend 90 billion to facilitate Hajj by Hajj travelers, many of whom can't feed. And I can't settle my problem with ASU and many other unions who are, whose total demand is less than 90 billion becomes a little difficult for people to retain the feeling and fervor of patriotism. So to that extent, the president has done his duty. He can't tell Nigerians not to make sacrifice. The question is, he needs to pay attention to the fact that the events around the state by those who are, the people are supposed to look up to is likely to induce more apathy, is likely to induce greater disengagement from the Nigerian state and loyalty to the state. And it's not about this government. It's been on in all the 25 years of democracy. If I'm in Borno and I can go and make arrangements with bandits, collect money from them for them to carry out robbery operations, it means I no longer have an understanding of three things. The sense of community, the sense of the Nigerian state, and what's in my interest to remain alive for a longer time. So this thing is much more dangerous. It's not that people are making sacrifices, but their sense of how they ought to live in order to continue to live is being lost. And all indications, observing from my part, which may be wrong observation, is that the elite is not sufficiently connected with the reality they are supposed to be managing. They can't go home. They are the ones people who look to shoot on the road with their fine cars. That is not enough concern. Who is not us talking here in Abuja about Nigeria is about the question of everybody in public office asking himself or herself two or three questions. Number one, how are my cousins in the village faring? Now, that's your most immediate impact perception of the Nigerian that you're talking about. How is my village looking? How is my town? How is the local government? What are the local government chairmen doing? Yes, they are being hamstrung by the state, but I'm a local government chairman 
I get 100 million every month. Ali, that's what's allocated. Nothing happens. So at that level, the leadership at every level, and we make the mistake of looking at the presidency when in fact we have people elect, elected all through the tiers. Nobody is asking them questions. Mm -hmm. And so that complicates everything for everybody. And that will make a call for sacrifice a little difficult to take seriously by the average person who doesn't know what he or she has to sacrifice anymore. Well, you know, this is also coinciding with um, May 29 and now Democracy Day. So the president's one year in office and also 25 years of Nigeria's um, unbroken democracy. So this is when this uh, season has also come, you know, coming really closely on the heels. Time for reflection as well and then celebration. But celebration, uh, you know, and things are really difficult to come by. But before now, uh, a number of people had visited the president, you know, to to keep him abreast of what is happening in their communities, let him know that things are uh, difficult in many parts. And the president has also tried to turn the attention to uh, what is also happening at the state and at the local government. I remember the Arawa Consultative Forum yes, visiting yeah. the president and you know, also asking them to challenge the state governors and the local government and, and see what is happening at that level. Because as a result of this fuel re removal, a real sub subsidy removal, you know, states and local government are getting more all allocation. And the questions as to really what is, how can we turn the light there? Because as you have highlighted, this is where the people are. That's where a lot of people reside, in the, in the local government, at the state level. Um, is there a way that we can actually raise the tempo in terms of getting governors and local government chairmen to be more accountable to the people that they serve? No, well, for me, the question is whether it's the people they serve. The problem is at two levels. At the level of the elite engagement, a growing decrease in a sense of responsibility and perception that public office for service delivery. At the level of the people you say they are serving, what are the demands the average person is making of anyone in public office? If you, Maupe, or Chamberlain, imagine a senator today, you're going to get a long list of people for school fees, for chieftaincy title, for their wives in hospital, etc. So you find that over time, too, there's also the wrong perception that once you're in office, you have access to funds that you don't need to account for, and so let's have part of it. So the thing is multiple. Three of us, let's suppose we are contesting elections now, and we all go, we're from the same area, and we get there, and I tell them the kind of things we need to do. You see, there's a lot of suffering here. We have a lot of wine tapers. I intend to provide a machine, you know, that... The, what they use, you just wrap it around the three, go up. The time it will take you to tap 15 palm trees. With this machine, you'll, be, you'll use it to tap 60. So I'll provide it a certain number. Everybody will rent it, all the tappers. So instead of spending five hours in the tapping this, then you spend 45 minutes. That's what I'll do when I become governor or whatever it is. Mm. I'll provide their boreholes. I'll do this. Things that will impact their lives. I'm going to facilitate farmers. Within the first one year, you'll get this type of, I finish saying all of that. Now, Mark Beck comes, yes, I'm contesting, and uh, all of you, anybody who will vote for me will get 10,000. Chamberlain offers you one. Nobody will take me seriously. So to that extent, you see that despite your good intention, there's already a demobilized public with the wrong expectations, with the wrong demands. And so those in public office who are genuinely determined to serve there's the greatest challenges from the expectations of the people. What's to be done? If you don't meet the wrong expectations, the expectations will begin to change. It's as simple as that. And so I've how, seen it. How, what should be the, how should they channel those expectations? The people? Yeah. No. They, now, there are platforms for public engagement. At the rural level, you have a town union president. In some places, you have district heads, etc. We must pay attention to the fact that most of these platforms for public political consciousness have also been taken over by those who are driving the wrong paradigms. Wait, wait, wait. Why will someone out there go out to a district head or, or whoever if they want solutions to their challenges? I'm talking, okay. We are talking about security. Let's just focus on security. Any new person who comes into a village, the people know that this man was, or this woman wasn't part of us. Why is that intelligence not going to the military, to SSS, to DSS? Instead, he comes around, they look, he find, if I find out he can give me some money from his activities, I keep quiet. That's part of the crisis, and that's part of why we're wasting the most developed human capital we have, which is the 
security and military. Pardon me, Mr. Jumpy. You know, I ask that because we will see politicians come up with palliatives. Mm. They say they want to get across to certain people who need some of these things. But at the end of the day, we only see that it doesn't make any difference to a large extent. Look, stand corrected. Because the same governors came uh, upon the inception of this government saying that the previous list or whatever register they had was, was false, invalid. it wasn't anything. Mm -hmm. Today, what do they have? What can they rely on? Because at the state level, people there cannot even get access to the basic amenities, basics. And so how do you, even if you have the best of policies, impact those at the grassroots where you should be? The solution is simple. Most of those who talk policies, uh, policies and I'm saying most, not all, understand an excellent policy you can deploy and change the lives of the people. But they don't understand the operating environment. Let's suppose that I'm from a state where there's a lot of water scarcity, and the policy is, if I provide water that people can access the point within one hour, they'll have more time to do other things. They'll have more time for farming, and therefore food production will go, overall productivity will increase, etc. And I go there to give water. And I talk to all the big men, the traditional ruler, they are nodding. But unknown to me, there are three people in that group who have the business of using tanker to sell water. And they make returns to either the traditional ruler of village head or the big boys. And as I'm talking, they are looking at an enemy. I have that fantastic policy. But I have zero understanding of the environment. That's why you see those who are talking about policy always making speeches on TV. It doesn't work because you know the, what the problem is. Okay, I know that chloroquine or whatever uh, will cure malaria. The question is whether the man who has malaria will drink it. So what would aid the disconnect between policy and the reality? Simple. If you don't understand the environment, try to understand. Okay, you are thinking of water. In every environment, there are power centers. And the power centers in that environment drive the interest they like. So I want to bring water. So I go check. How have they been getting water? Oh, those of them who are slightly wealthier than the rest buy water from these water tanker dealers. The ordinary people, some of them also buy a major stakeholder in that environment would be the water dealer. If I discover the cartel is too powerful, I'll negotiate for space sharing. No problem with this water thing, but I was thinking of sinking nine boreholes. I'm going to sink four. Now the poorest of the poor will get water from there. Those who don't have time for that will be. So if you are you're looking for heaven on earth, you must be on drugs. The place is dominated by bad boys, bad boys and girls, so you don't go with the preachment of the ideal in your scripture, no. You want to make impact. Find out how to make impact. Don't go around grumbling that you know we have this fallacy. Nigerians are suffering. We know Nigerians are suffering. The elite is bad. We know the elite is bad. Your intervention is it taking the right route for impact? You want, okay, I want to make impact in Kano. I go there and I'm making speeches in stadium to the people. What's the power center in Kano? It includes the Emirate, it includes Imams, it includes villages, district heads, etc., youth organizations. I go to them one after the other. This is what we are thinking. What do you think? And this is something I've done in a state. By the time we were done, we had 5,131 youths who are beneficiaries. And all the stakeholders came. Now, you have those who understand the solution. Theoretically. And it's working in the U.S. and everywhere. This is not the U.S. This is not the Netherlands. This is not Poland. What can work for you? That is the question we are not addressing. Okay. The government has spent a lot on development, on interventions, on palliatives, who accessed it. You mentioned the issue of figures. Imagine that you come to my village and the traditional ruler. Look, this is going to the state. It's been given to me as governor. What are the power center and administrative structures in my state? It, it includes so, so, and so. Yeah. They now give you Chamberlain. 15,000 bags of rice for your village, not for the state capital. And you will keep it and village uh, family heads will not come. We are pretending that the elected elite constitutes those who can reach Nigerians. And so when you say we've got 2.5 million tons of this and that for Nigerians, you're only telling us about record of expenditure, not evidence of impact. That's part of the crisis. How do you reconcile that evidence of impact? Because what they largely may do is, <laughs> as long as they think they've spent the money, and as long as they think they will win the next elections, that's topmost in a I politician's agree. book. You ask what I would do. What I would do is to identify, okay, how many, okay, take for instance, I'm from Anambra State. There are 177 communities, right? 
you brought 250,000 bags of rice. I divided it into 177. And I called them. I will say, I'll make an announcement in the state. We'll have a meeting with so so and so in waves, traditional rulers, town union presidents. The information gets to the last person. And to the extent that it gets to the last person, there will be demand for explanation. But when I made the announcement, you know, we in government, we are suffering. People are not realizing it. Say the bags we've brought, gotten. A disposition to only speak at, and deal at the superstructural level is part of the crisis on the table as we speak. Because for me, how can they say I haven't tried? I mean, this is number of bags. The question, did it get there? Did you have the right structures to make sure it got to the ground? Those are the things. And so when at this level I'm talking about all the effort, people are not appreciated. Look, the, somebody in the position of the president is, is in trouble. When, the higher you go, the more dependent you are on it's an assistance and structures and processes. Do, do, do you think we're holding, because today, tomorrow, public holiday. Yep. You drive through any part of this country, you see a lot of idle citizens just sitting idling by, waiting and hoping for the next, wherever it is that comes from. Or who they rob. Those are armies. Mm -hmm. That danger staring us in the face. In fact, it was during NSAs that many people said, I didn't even know we had a lot of these kind of persons who are around us. They didn't know because you're stuck up with your, your thing, way of life. You, you go out, you come go, back. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that's it. So are we holding the governors accountable enough? Because if the system is broken, the same governors, when you talk about local government function, they say, no, you, you can't have which part of the world do you have someone from local government also going to the center to collect. But they have fundamental problems that have broken, that have not been fixed. Are we holding them accountable enough? Well, I'll move from the root of the crisis to accountability issues. We have a massive population of unemployed young people with a lot of energy. Yeah. They went to school or they learned a trade. They don't have the money with which to stand, um, carry out the trade. Or they can't find employment even though they went to school. But you have those who went to school, bribed their teachers to pass or slept with them to pass. They have the certificate, they have no skill. They are unemployable. That's number one. You have those who didn't go anywhere, but they've grown up begging or loafing around or doing organizing work or doing what create, part of what created the crisis in Banex Plaza the other day, which is idle unemployed youths. As you're approaching the supermarket or the market, they come to you, Madam, what do you want? Look, we have it in our shop. He doesn't know any shop. He doesn't have any shop. He takes you to the shop. And then, oh, this is, you want to buy this television? It is, um, he said, please don't give him good price, a bad price. I know you are now telling him it's 100,000. He has given him the map from where to start. The TV is selling for, for 43,000. <laughs> and he says, uh, well, you, you're trying to spoil market. I'll sell it for 95. He said, no, no, no. I'm the one who brought him. Um, okay, 80. So is it not too much? He says it's because of you. You pay 80 for a TV for which you pay. Why do I think it happened to you before? Yeah? <laughs> Why do I think this has happened to you before? Not only that, <laughs> I carried out a detailed study of this across several markets and across different parts of the country. That's what they now do. Now you pay, yes, you pay 80,000 for a 43,000 thing you came to buy. He goes away, you thank him and even probably give him a little money. Of course, he doesn't need to come back in a hurry. Either that day or the next day, he'll come. There's a sharing formula. Now, all those boys running around the place, their total population exceeds that of those who own shops by two. They are being demobilized from becoming responsible citizens, responsible adults, or responsible parents, because this is criminality as part of business. It's all over. The, the first time I witnessed it was in Lagos in the 80s, so it's not a new thing. Now that population has become the dominant population, and the concept of right and wrong has disappeared. So where is that taking us? It's taking us to people who are unemployable at the level of risk of a skill and unemployable at the level of value. Because anything you ask them to do, what they're looking for is an opportunity to make money for themselves. They don't see connection between office title and service delivery. Now, many of them are migrating into public office. That's why I spent $2 billion to go to Senate. And when I come on, uh, what do you call it, oversight function to channels, you're telling me, oh, you need to show me your student. I say, but we're in a hurry. Uh, what do you have for us? Mm. And the thing gets taken to two. You can see the enormity of the crisis. And oh. those who only focus on criticizing the federal government are pretending that the real crisis of the Nigerian state today is not the collapse of every value that holds a society together, spanning decades. We are suffering now. 
did I, did, was this not talked about? I think I said it on this program uh, long before Tinubu became president that we're going to have a food crisis. Mm -hmm. When a farmer cannot harvest because of banditry, he yeah. planted. When some can't plant because of banditry, when farm food producing areas are no longer accessible, instead the people are in refugee camps, you're spending billions to maintain them, their productivity is not coming into the economy. Why price, price does not come because somebody made a motivational speech? It has to be planted. Yeah. Food prices, like you were saying before the program, tomato. Mm -hmm. If somebody is known to have tomatoes, people are prepared to hire a helicopter at millions of naira to come for that's how house crisis has become. You can't invent a tomato by speaking. Mm. Productivity is not there. Now, security is also not there. So the concept of the state as that place you run to for protection, either for electricity or water or whatever, keeps disappearing. And so securing loyalty to the Nigerian state is something disloyalty has developed over the years and is at its peak now with the hunger. It is an elite and leadership problem and not an APC government problem because it was there with PDP. If either um, Peter B or Atiku had become president, the bulk of the problem we have now would happen because already the foundations were laid. In other words, the chickens have come home to roost. They have nowhere to roost. Actually, the chickens are all over the compound. They came back to roost and they're, so they are making a lot of noise. People can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. I mean, because when you look at just how chaotic the picture that you have painted is, the scenario and how dire it seems, um, I'm wondering whether we are truly, I mean, I'm sure, of course, we're all feeling the, 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 the impact of what is going on in the economy. We're seeing the danger to, you know, even those who are managing to, you know, be productive in this economy. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether we understand the urgency with, with which we need to, you know, convene something to see what it is we can, we can begin to do to get things back on track. We uh, understand the urgency. Do you see any urgency anywhere? Your pocket is compelling you to feel the urgency. I do. All our expenses have gone up. The elite context is different. In fact, 24th, 25th of this month, we are having a roundtable, a national roundtable on asymmetrical security challenges, the Army and national development. We are doing it in partnership with Nigerian Army Resource Center and practically all stakeholders, NUJ, NAN, and the rest of it. When we talk security, say what, you know, I use the expression where we can convince something, you know, to really find out what the problem is. One, we know what the problem is. Yeah, two, but the question for two, me, yeah, is after you've convened that, mm. what happens to... Precisely, that's where I was headed. Yeah, what happens Because what, what you what get from such it? gatherings is, I probably come and speak for one hour mm -hmm. on the security challenges. First, I'll define security. I'll tell you how badly it affects the economy and how it creates unemployment. After that, our recommendation that government should do something urgent about security, that is blissful chatter. First, all I told you are things you knew, what security does. My recommendation does not have any implementation strategy. That's what you've been getting. That way you say, oh, we have so many reports, it's not blame. You can't implement something that has a generalized recommendation. Let's suppose the crisis I've come to address is youth unemployment. The facts are on the table. I've recommended the youth should be employed, should be this and that. Implementation strategies. Step number one, take inventory of the total population of youth. Find out how many of them are employed, have skills. Find out how many among those who have skills, those who can't get a job. Find those who need to be retooled because they have no skill. On the basis of that, if I now say I'm planning an employment program, I'll know the right population. But with the general recommendation, provide jobs as your aid as a governor. I'll come, Your Excellency, we are, we are working on that recommendation. We are going to start a youth empowerment program. And you booked a hall for 500,000 people or whatever. On what basis? So executive decision making cannot easily arise from nebulous recommendations. That's also in addition to the fact you have a totally validated environment. And one more point on that before I drop. Data matters. Recently, the federal government called for an inventory population of all schools, mm -hmm. primaries, and all levels. Now you're talking on employment and education. If you follow the 2005-2006 census, the number of young people who ought to be in primary school by that figure, after the school census, should, be, should have been 47 point something million. The actual number in school, as at that time, verified from school census, was 23 point something, 24 point something million. The number that should have been in primary, in secondary school, 
at that point was given the bracket of age for being in secondary school was 33.9 million. The actual number in school was 6.4. Tertiary, we don't need to talk about it. Millions of people would take, there's no carrying capacity. So if 1.5 million people ride jam, you have space for 450. They are all out there not, and they're not going into any vocational training. Where does that leave us? It leaves us with a massive growing population about which nobody knows anything and is planning, not planning anything. And so the crisis depends, the population increases, we define what the people need as the elite and leave it at that. We are defining it from here. There's a disconnect that needs to be addressed and it's not happening the way it ought to in many places. Some, they are trying. Well, Prof, um, good morning. And I don't know if it's apt to say Barakandesa. Good morning, Barakandesa. good to see you. Yeah, same here, sir. I'm, I'm sure it's apt to say Barakandesa, even though... Anyway, let me leave that one. Uh, you know, you've spoken to a number of don't things. Don't leave it. Sorry to interrupt you. Don't leave it. Please, say Barca de Sala. If I... you don't get a ram, go and call the tail of somebody's own and use that evidence that you have ram. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, Prof, um, I, I'd like you to speak to something. I don't know what to call it. Is it over-centralization, need for decentralization, or need for specificity? In the states, because, I mean, Chamberlain asked you a question around what the states are doing or not doing. Uh, concerning the issue of electricity supply, um, resource control, uh, revenue generation, uh, minimum wage uh, debacle and all of that. Are we over-centralizing? Can we decentralize? Is there any specificity to the peculiar challenges of each state in each of these points? First of all, the challenge revolves around the quality of human capital and the method we've been using to manage human capital. The second is the perception of leadership positions and leadership relevance in development. And the third is the fact that most states invest in infrastructure but not in what will affect the people. And i use an example. Um, I think the last, and I've mentioned this more than once on television, the last Federal Executive Council, Executive Council meeting of the Buhari government during his first term, or was it the last well, while in office. There was that executive council meeting where the sum of 4.2 billion was voted for model, six model primary secondary schools in the six geopolitical zones of the country. Fantastic idea. Each of these schools would be the best in facilities and all the rest of it. And my question is simple. Is this an investment in education, an investment in education infrastructure? Is investment in education infrastructure because new classrooms will deliver nothing? If you want model secondary schools, as I speak, there are over 120 unity schools all over the country. Spread that money among them, you'll have 100 and something model secondary schools. And each of them will begin to turn out something within, within the next two years after the facility and teacher upgrade, pay the teachers more, etc. But a model school of the type being talked about will probably be under construction for five years. It will not impact human capital availability in 10 years, so you just thrown good money away. The same thing, I think even before that, KB did the same, built new primary schools. Look, teacher education, teacher development, learning outcomes, that's the right kind of investment. So bringing it back substantially to the matter you raised. For as long as the perception of the problem that needs to be <coughs> solved is wrong, for so long will you generate solutions that make no impact whatsoever on the people and on your environment. So question of decentralization, the other question to ask is, those who are occupying these positions now, how were they prepared for it? What did they think was their job to do in that place? They are not the ones who occupied that for the first time. Jack Conde was governor in Lagos State. He lived in his own house. He made no unusual demands. He did in four years what made many, many governors didn't do half of in eight years. So it's not as if there are no paradigms. Centralization of authority, must make sense in terms of somebody who takes ultimate responsibility or who devolves powers and responsibilities and has a feedback system that enables him to find out that things are being properly done. Mm. Yes, the federal government, I think, set up a monitoring facility the other day. Every state governor who takes himself seriously should have a review meeting every week. On so so and so thing we discussed during this council meeting was the update on it. That should happen so that you keep checking out what you've done. Also, before you run a new budget, you must look at the previous budget. We are supposed to deliver these 11 items. How many of them have we delivered? It's on the basis of that we'll do a new budget. Mm -hmm. But if you look at budgets, most states, but mostly states, but 
particularly federal, an old budget is picked up, baptized and given a new name. A revised, very often substandard version is put on the table. We pass it as a law to be carried out. That law is not carried out because much of it is not executed. And you look at the next budget, most of what you find in the previous one are still there. Look at states, take democracy 25 years, go and check all the things the governors have done. You find that many governors are giving boreholes to communities that were once given boreholes by their predecessors. That's why I say there's too much record of expenditure, no evidence, limited evidence of service delivery, questionable claims about impact because poverty is increasing as you're spending more. And when you come for a self-evaluation, you write out a list of the wonderful things you've done. And if anybody wasn't around and was only to read your report, they would say your citizens or your, those you're governing are in heaven. That disconnect, that tendency to invent tales by moonlight as an account of what government is doing, particularly in the states. Painted buildings, oh, roads are being constructed. How are the people faring? That is what matters. And I'm those not sure. who could pay their rent before, how many of them are no longer paying? Hmm. You know, Prof, I, I'm, I'm not even sure that, well, because we've spoken about the issue of accountability a, a number of times, and the question I keep asking is, who will monitor, who will prepare the accountability parameters, and who is going to monitor the states? Perhaps that's another matter for another time, but to, to the issue you mentioned about how the, the citizens are faring, it's very, very concerning. Um, Allow me to draw you into the issue of this minimum wage matter in the light of the purchasing power of Nigerians. Uh, now, there are those who are talking about how much the minimum wage should be, but very few people are talking about the productivity that should come with the minimum wage. To the private sector, a, an increased wage bill is an increased production uh, bill. But I don't know if that is part of the conversation and whether or not we should decentralize the concentration of what the minimum wage should be per state. If I am in state A, and my total income internally generated revenue plus federal allocation is 10 naira, and you ask for a minimum wage it cannot accommodate, I will not pay it. If I'm not as wealthy as Lagos State or as some other state, you can't point to Lagos State and tell me see what they are paying. If you prefer their pay, go there. But there must be a wage that makes sense in any environment. It must be connected with income. You can't, okay, look, I'm your father. Um, I give you an allowance of 10,000 a week. But there's your friend that the father gives 25,000 a week. And you say, well, daddy, I don't know what the hell is going on in this house, you know. Fred and the Musa, they all get 25,000. You're giving me 10,000. I say, my son, sit down. Let's look at it. This is my income. This is what goes into rent. This goes into feeding. This is what your siblings are getting. So that's why you get. You say, no, 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 daddy, you're not being realistic. Look around. Others. I have no need to look around. I'm dealing with my income. I think that was the situation sometime in Anambra when Peter was governor. I believe it was the doctors who were on strike. We can't take this. We can't take that. If you go to a bond, you say, this is what they are being paid. He said, well, go there and get paid. He actually brought the budget of the state. I think it's also included teachers. Look at the state budget. Look at what will be taken out of it if I do this minimum wage. So you guys, tell me how you think, because these are money in this state. Some said, we don't care. You're the governor. Find the money. He didn't. So what am I leading up to? Minimum wage must make sense. Nigerian workers are suffering, but they also forget. Let's also not forget that it is not only those in government employ that are workers. Number two. Productivity, responsible elite leadership, elite spending, and elite behavior will impact people in such a way that, yes, they will know they are suffering. And they will, look, when um, uh, Babangida told us that Nigerians should tighten their belt, it was a lot, of people, a lot of people went along with it until it became unbearable. Now, the summary of what I'm saying is the states, the pay packet of today is unrealistic given the new costs and inflation and still increasing inflation wasn't by insecurity, among other things. Each state, if we make a law saying that each state will pay the same thing, we must look across, since we say we're borrowing democracy from the U.S. and the rest of the world, we must ask ourselves whether the man in Texas earns the same thing as the person in Illinois or in New York. So worker, the working population is having a rough time, no question, because in their own case, unlike private people, they must mandatorily 
go to work every day. It carries costs. But when you move it to national minimum wage, I can understand that. But you have an organization, I have an SME, I produce bread, and you tell me minimum wage is this and that, and I can't afford it. So employers of labor, I believe, will be able to negotiate what their workforce can live with and what they... But if you make it mandatory, you're not being realistic. All trees don't have the same height, mm. the same gait, or the same kind of leaves. So for the conversation on bringing greater realism to bear on the, this debate is important. But what makes it really terrible is that successive governments, and this is probably the eight of such governments, never manage to keep to the agreements they make with ASU and many other unions. And the issue please that there is no money. But when you watch that money, huge sums of money in billions of naira can be spent within a few days of being requested from a government that says there is no money, for instance, to handle education, it makes you distrustful, it damages citizen loyalty, patriotism is thrown out through the window, etc. Mm. All right, we need to anchor at that point, but one of the uh, other suggested solutions will be states have not got to be in a race to ensure they have cottage industries across board because that uh, could be one of the ways we could address some of these challenges. Thank you for coming on this morning, Professor Okei Kechuku, Executive Director of Development Specs Academy. We will be back in a moment, but uh, business morning on uh, Sunrise Daily is up next.